Okay, everybody, we're going to start. Um, welcome to this ResHop session. It's great to have the chance to tell you what we're doing in Kick, but also to uh, give you some thoughts about how you might think about your own fields. Because I'll be talking about how data science relates to education. You may or may not care about how data science relates to education. What you may be interested in is how data science relates to whatever your field of inquiry is. Um, we are recording this, and the slides will, and movie will be up afterwards. So, first of all, how many people here will consider themselves to be data scientists? <laughs> Mitra. Okay. How many people here are applying data science or working with people who are using data science in their field? Okay, we've got a few more. Okay. And how many folks here are sort of feeling a bit outside of data science, but you know, just keen to learn more? Is that everybody else? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, all right. So I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about what we do in KIC, the Connected Intelligence Center, but also hopefully give you a way of thinking about data science. Okay. And I'd like you to leave today armed perhaps with some new questions that you would ask when somebody rolls up saying, we can use analytics, we can use data science. You know, big data is the answer. Okay. I'm going to put a proposal to you, which is, you know, UTS is busy thinking about how it becomes more powerful, more effective with data science as a research topic. And I'm going to suggest to you that a hallmark of UTS could be that we approach with a human-centered perspective in the way that we use data and analytics and AI. And of course, by the end of today, you should understand a bit more about what I mean by human-centered. Okay. Briefly, for those of you who don't know, KIC is a bit of an organizational innovation experiment here at UTS. Okay. We sit up there reporting direct to Shirley Alexander, but working closely with academics and the faculties and with other people around the university who are busy analyzing the data of the university. Okay. So we're a hybrid research and services center, which is a weird kind of creature. Okay. So we are full of researchers. We have a PhD program, um, but we're not in a faculty. We're reporting straight to the DVC, and we're staffed primarily by academics with a small admin team to support us. And we designed and launched the Master of Data Science and Innovation. We ran that until the end of last year when we handed it over to the Transdisciplinary Innovation Faculty. And we have a PhD program. So we look a bit like a research group in a faculty, but our job is to impact how UTS functions by making better use of analytics, data science, visualization, statistics. Okay? And we've actually written about what it's like trying to run a center like that and why we seem to be straddling lots of different boundaries that most units don't. So you can follow that up afterwards if you're interested. OK, so what do we do? We do what we call learning analytics. That is the world of education. And for those of you who teach, you know, you will be familiar with certainly some of those concepts. Uh, you may not consider yourself to be an educational researcher, so you're not so much in the learning sciences. But you're teaching, you're designing curriculum, you are trying to figure out how to assess students. Okay? And then on the other side, we have the world of data science, analytics, statistics, classification, machine learning, text processing, visualization, building predictive models. And those two worlds are really quite different universes. Okay? People on the right may know nothing about the people on the left and vice versa. And our job is to figure out how do those talk Okay. What's missing is a vital third circle, which we could call the human factors. The things that actually get a technology used and adopted by real people, not just by their research champions. Somebody trying to get in the door there. <laughs> okay. And by human factors, we're talking about things like who, got it, who was involved in the process of designing this? How can we give people different? How can we give non-technical people a voice in shaping the software? What's the quality of the user interface? Right, we've all used really cruddy user interfaces and wondered who on earth the software designer had in mind when they designed this thing. Privacy and ethics, of course, big issues. 
all the factors that determine whether you would actually use this tool in your day-to-day -day life, Monday to Friday. Okay. And that fits into organizational strategy as well. Okay. If UTS is moving in one direction and I'm inventing tools that are pulling in a different direction from the learning and teaching strategy, that's probably not going to work either. If I'm designing something for you that's not going with the grain of how you want to teach and how you want to assess, that's not going to fly either. Right? Training. There's a large graveyard of cool ed tech tools that never really got used because the staff never had the time and capacity to learn how to use them well. Okay, so there's our holy trinity. That is a human-centered design discipline. Okay, and so move number one is to say, okay, let's take learning out, and what would your discipline be in there? Okay, and I'm proposing that a human-centered design discipline of XYZ analytics is something that we should be thinking about. Okay, this is the big question for learning analytics. Can we tell from your digital profile if you're learning? Okay. In another field it could be, can we tell if you're healthy? Can we tell if you are uh, likely to commit a crime? Can we tell if uh, you are likely to, you know, abscond? Can we tell if you deserve a discount in your driving insurance premium. You know, the world of analytics and big data is trying to answer, can we tell from your digital traces whether you are worthy or progressing, or you know, where are you? Trying to, trying to, categorize, trying to categorize you, basically. Okay? And these are the kinds of critical questions we need to start asking. Okay? Well, who's this we? Who's getting to see the data? How will they be able to tell? Will they be able to understand these fancy dashboards that we're going to put in front of them? Will they need training? What is this digital profile? Where's the data coming from? Do we trust it? And learning, well, learning covers a huge realm of things from do you understand photosynthesis to can you resolve a conflict online? Okay, a huge realm, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so the human-centered lens starts to unpack a statement like that and the vendors will be telling you that now at last you can see if your students are learning because we've got a dashboard that tracks them okay it's a bit more complicated than that so let me just show you a few examples of what learning analytics looks like just so you have an idea okay so the kinds of things that an, an analytics system might tell you are well what percentage of students have actually downloaded the assignment two weeks before the deadline and you might decide whether that's a good signal that they're organized. Or is that already too late? That's a very simple kind of question. Has Anne mastered the core concepts of photosynthesis? Oh, now we're talking about learning in some way. Which French verbs is John struggling with? A teacher might be wondering. Is Joe likely to fail based on how she's doing and how similar she is to other students who failed. That's a predictive model. That's quite controversial, potentially. Or maybe that's exactly what universities need in order to step in earlier and make an intervention of some sort. Which bits of the video are watched most? Very basic question that might give you some insight into the bits the students keep replaying because they're struggling with it. Did the students who did the flipped activities very late, still achieve good results. Okay? So these are the kinds of questions that, fail, you know, that, that analytics products now can help you answer. Here's a standard dashboard from Canvas, which is, uh, as you know, one of the learning management systems now in use here. It's showing you some pretty simple stuff. Okay? Up here, it just shows you the number of page views in a day uh, over the months. Okay? So you can just see whether there are some People are clearly logging in a lot at the start of the year, and then it, it's, there's some peaks, and it's starting to fade out. Assignments, okay? Green means they submitted on time. Orange means they were past the due date. Red means it wasn't submitted at all. Each green bar is an assignment, and this is showing you on the bottom the kinds of grades they were getting. That's the range of the grade, uh, and there's the median score in the horizontal bar, okay? So, okay. handy stuff. Yes? Can you drill down to who the actual students are in that context? Yes, you can, if you're a teacher. 
Okay. All right, so these are in the products now. They just come out of the box. But were they learning? Who knows? This is telling you if you're learning, okay? This is an adaptive tutoring system which is drilling you in, in this case, you know, English grammar. As you prepare for a maths test, uh, sorry, for an English test in the States, okay? And you've got your red, amber, green progress bars against very fine-grained, um, you know, verbal uh, competencies here, okay? So if this tool is doing the job well, you've got a very fine-grained picture of how you're going. That's finer grained than you'd get from a human. And this is running 24-7, and it's never going to get bored or frustrated with you. Or perhaps it's maths. In this case, statistics. OK. A question here about what the most appropriate visualization would be to use, given this scenario. OK. When students use this with a periodic tutoring session, the results are impressive. They learnt a whole semester material, semester's material in half the time and performed at least as well as students learning in a traditional way. Okay? That's worth taking notice of. Let's think about something completely different, student effort. So this is an example from a colleague who's in one of, who was, until recently, teaching in one of the Sydney high schools here. They developed a simple rubric for teachers to assess how much effort a student is putting in. He's trying to break the obsession with just grades and trying to get students to think about how much effort and trying to build their resilience. Okay? This kind of delayed effect of effort on academic performance can be seen in other students. For example, student number 618 sees a decline in his effort from term 1 to 2, but his academics stay the same. However, from term 2 to 3, the decline in his effort in term 1 appears to have an effect on his academic performance, even though his effort is now improving. Nevertheless, by turn three to four, his effort continues to improve and we see a turnaround in his academic. Okay, so there's not really any AI or anything clever going on here. This is simply charting effort against grade over time with a very compelling visualization. This is used with students to have a conversation with them, not to hit them over the head with it, but to say, what's going on? You know, as soon as you start changing your effort, that will immediately register fast feedback and, and, and encouragement. Your grades may delay, okay? This is also a conversation with parents, okay? So we're having a very different quality of conversation with the learner and with the parents in this case, because these are children. And this was also co-developed closely with the staff, because if the staff don't buy into this as an assessment tool, then of course the whole thing will fail. Rubbish data, rubbish analytics. Yeah, quick question. Quick question. The key there is observational assessments. What observations? And is that affected by the teacher? Yeah. The okay. The What's the quality of data? How is it done? It's done by teachers. Observations of the students. There's a, a long and complicated story around that, but obviously if the teachers haven't been trained and aren't up to a certain level of competency, again, the data will, will not be good. Okay. So that's why we have to think about the system, the whole human computer system, it's not just about, look, I can do cool visualizations. Okay. A field exercise. The students are out exploring the environment, but they're not online. But of course, we don't have to be online these days, as in in front of a computer, in order to be online. Right? I'm carrying a supercomputer around with me in my pocket all the time. Suitably armed, this could tell what my posture was. Okay. Are these students 
getting down on their hands and knees in the right places when they're doing a given task? Are they looking up in the branches when they should have been? Okay? So posture is now digitizable and quantifiable. So we can be out in the wild now and still gathering analytics in order to give feedback to teachers and students. Okay, so those are a few examples just to stretch your minds about what we mean by learning analytics. Okay? There are traditional kinds of data in the school and university system, and then there are all the new kinds of digital data that are coming off mobile devices, internet of things, etc. First thing, so we've already touched on the need to design the human and the computer system together. A little bit more on how we do design, okay? Because if I just announce that we've got an amazing new tool for you and you're all expected to use it next semester, we know how that will end. Okay? What we want is to involve you here at the university anyway, because we're not just buying black boxes. We are also co we're inventing new kinds of technology within the university here in the Connected Intelligence Center. So how we design. So give me, let me give you a few examples. Uh, and these are, of course, teamwork efforts from, from, from students as well as from um, uh, our, our postdoc researchers. Okay, over in the health faculty, students are practicing treating mannequin patients. We can now instrument that space in more ways than was previously possible. As the price of you know, wristbands and microphones and positioning devices, you know, being able to slap a little device on that and tell when it was picked up and what orientation it was at is now just affordable. Okay? So those students go into a simulation and we are now streaming all sorts of data off there. Okay? The question is, what would be useful feedback for that team? So we have been going through a series of exercises. Here we have the teacher talking about if only she had certain superpowers. Okay? The superpowers would mean that rather than her trying to track six different student beds and give them all good feedback at the end, she had omniscient knowledge of what they were doing, the equivalent of being able to study every group individually very closely and give them immediate good feedback. Okay? So we go through this envisioning exercise with them, all very low tech with pens and stickies. We involve the students as well. We get them to draw what their journey is as they go into this simulation on the ward and at what points would, value, would feedback be really valuable. Okay? And out of that, we can start to understand what would be useful feedback if we could invent a software tool to give that back. And here's the current prototype of a timeline that can be generated now. Uh, and you can see um, the following features. We've got three nursing roles, RN one to three, which tells us what they were doing when. They used a particular device, the oxygen. They administered medication then, because the mannequin knows when it's been given medicine and what, what kinds of treatment it's been receiving. Critical incident, patient state changes, loss of consciousness, and then we want to see them jump into action. Okay, and we can see what they did. So after the exercise, this can come up on the display and they can have an, an evidence-based debrief with the tutor and reflect on how that went. And perhaps why is your display so different from another group's? Of course, we want to empirically evaluate that with the students as well. Is this actually useful? If you could replay this when you got back to your room on your laptop along with the video, would that be useful? So these are the kinds of questions we would ask. Another example. It's now possible for students to get immediate feedback on their draft writing. Okay? This is work with Simon Knight and Kirsty Kitto, Shibani here, who's a, one of our PhD candidates, and Sophie Abel. Okay, this is an example where we're giving students feedback on their ability to write a good research abstract. Okay? Now we know from a lot of research into the sort of the, the linguistics and genre analysis. But typically, researchers do those three things. Okay? You establish the research territory, which says, this is a terribly important topic, wake up and take notice. You establish a niche, which is to say, but. There's always a but. All right? We've got a problem. 
there's a tension, there's a disagreement, we're missing knowledge, we don't understand how to do this, previous work has managed this but didn't, couldn't do that, whatever the, the gap is, okay? And then you step into it, of course, with, and I have something to offer, okay? Now, we can recognize when students are making those moves um, with natural language processing. We can spot move types one when they emphasize a significant or important idea or they give background information and review the state of the art. We can spot when they're contrasting an idea or talking about a disagreement. We can spot when they're talking about missing knowledge. And we can spot move three, stepping in and making some kind of claim about the value of their work and telling the reader what's to come in the article. So here's a canonical example of an abstract. Okay. It's now widely accepted that blah de blah de blah is essential for effective learning. Okay, that's a statement about the importance of feedback in this case. Okay. Move two. From a human-centered perspective, dum de dum de dum de dum is a critical challenge with evidence that dum de dum de dum are not necessarily effective. Okay, these are the cues from the grammatical structure of the sentence that the, that the machine recognizes as a particular kind of rhetorical move. And then later on, we tell the reader, we present a pilot study that tells the reader what's coming. You know, the dual purpose is, these are these signposts that tell the reader what's to come. Okay. This is, in my view, a very poor abstract. I lifted it from a journal, so I mean, this has been published, but clearly in this discipline, it's quite acceptable to have an abstract which is just a series of assertions. There is no argument, right? There's no attempt to persuade the reader of any conclusion. It's just a series of assertions, and clearly that's okay in this field, but I would never get one of my students writing an abstract like that, okay? So if it comes back all white, well, it's possible that you have been very subtly making those moves, but the message is, well, the machine couldn't spot it, so maybe a human couldn't either. Okay. Okay. Now, so an example of how we involve the academics in the design of this is we wrote uh, a blog post. You can read more about this. But here we have two academics on the left and right working with one of our team. And what we're trying to do is tune the parser's response to, to words to do with emotion and affect. Okay. So this is actually from a different kind of writing, reflective writing, where students talk about their feelings when they were on work placement, for example, as well as what they learned. So without understanding any of the details there, all you need to understand there is we are rapidly tuning the parser in response to the feedback from the academics as to whether the kinds of uh, scores that are coming back here are appropriate. Are these words that they would expect to see highlighted in the text or not? Okay? And that means that we can then implement that and you know, within a week or two, they can see a new version of the, the feedback tool in action. Okay. They are actually shaping the software code that we're hoping they're going to use with their students. Okay. And that tool has now been released open source, which is another approach to transparency and human-centeredness, because we don't want black boxes in education which no one understands. Okay. And that's out there, and it's started be, to be used by other universities. Final example. Um, we have a student blogging platform that we've been using with our data science students. And um, Carlos, uh, one of our students, has invented a deck of playing cards. These are cards that represent different kinds of knowledge and expertise that you need to talk about when you are designing an analytics system. So in this case, um, you can see the design of the card. It's a particular, it's a category. Um, it's got an icon, it's got a description, okay? There's a whole set of these, and the idea is that different people around the table, the software designer, the student, the teacher, the uh, educational researcher, the analytics expert, can play these cards as they have a conversation about what kind of feedback they think the system should uh, be giving to students. So start, you, know, you can see starting with a learning objective, and you write down on the card what you think the learning objective is, and then we go through all sorts of discussion about what kind of analytics might be useful, what will be on the user interface. You can invent anything called a wildcard if you want to add something new. You can talk about where would the time and money be invested if we were to take this forward. 
Okay? So it's a bit like a game, but it's a structured game, and the idea is that anyone can play. All right? Okay, so that's three examples of how we do co-design or participatory design, as it's called. I'm going to step back now, and this is where... So hopefully, part one, you might be thinking, that's a technique that we might be able to use in designing our own systems. Um, but number two, I want to just step back and look at, think about the anatomy of a learning analytics system. Because this is another way of thinking in a human-centered way. Okay? So when we are observing students, that's, that's a sensitive thing to do. When, as researchers, we study any phenomena, we know that we are using a particular lens to study that. Okay? That lens both enhances the signals that we're after, but it also distorts the field of vision. Okay. So especially when we're talking about digital data and trying to make conclusions from digital data, there are all sorts of issues about how we are cutting that lens. Okay. So as we go through this analytic cycle of sensing the world, trying to make sense of it, and then perhaps making some intervention, human decisions are being made all around that cycle. That's just a generic analytic cycle. Okay? So we have a slogan that data doesn't speak for itself, which is often what you hear. Let the data speak for itself. Well, no. Data must be given a voice. Data is not neutral. Okay. So education is in transition to a world where increasingly we're going to be seeing what's going on through computational models. That is the shift of data science. Okay? You see the world through digital data and through the lens of computational models. So, especially if we're studying humans, but in any field, you have to understand your instruments. You have to understand what they're good for and what they're not good for. You have to understand how they blind you as well as give you insight. Or we end up in places like this. Okay. And that's the context now, post-Snowden, post-Cambridge Analytica, in which everybody who's working in AI and data and analytics, especially with human subjects, that's, that sets the sort of tone for everything we do. And that's not something we can uninvent. There are you know, justified concerns around privacy and ethics and surveillance. Now, the good news is that we understand that this is how this works in quite a lot of detail now. So in fields like the study of science and technology by social scientists, you know, they have documented how classification schemes work, how humans invent classification schemes, how classification schemes help us remember, but they are also systematically erasing. Because what doesn't fit in the classification scheme becomes invisible. Okay. So this book, Sorting Things Out, is just the most awesome milestone book if you're interested in understanding how that works. Okay? And the name is brilliant, right? Sorting things out, as well as sorting things in. So this idea that we can sort things out by classifying them and organizing them is a double-edged sword. And that's becoming you know, more and more familiar to the world. You know, books like The Tyranny of Metrics, which is out at the moment, bemoaning the fact that we've become obsessed with counting, classifying, indexing, league tabling, and managing performance in this way. And the good news is that there are now some fantastic books out there which talk about the, the dark side of data science, the dark side of algorithms, the dark side of building predictive models that classify people. And um, you know, I recommend you take a look at some of those. Okay. And we start to see conferences emerging now, such as the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference, okay, which is about bringing computer scientists together with people who are concerned about social justice. Very, very powerful combination. Okay, so it's interesting being in my field now because other academics are basically, their job is to track and monitor what people like me do. It's kind of weird, right? Um, May, I don't know how many others of you are in that kind of area. I guess if you're in any kind of area which is slightly controversial, there will be people doing this. 
you know, but you know, rather than telling them where to go, the goal is to engage with them and welcome that critique. Right? So people like Ben Williamson, you know, developing quite sophisticated analyses of how education is becoming datafied you know, at every level, internationally, nationally, regionally, and down to the level of the school uh, and, the, and the university. Or Neil Selwyn down at Monash. Again, you know, we invited him to our conference to give one of the keynote talks and tell us how he sees our field emerging in very critical terms, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic and disciplined way. Okay, so data science is transforming one field after another. And what we need are ways of thinking about what we're doing. And uh, if we're going to build data-intensive research infrastructures. And this is what uh, I'm very interested in at the moment. So who's heard of the fourth paradigm book? Anyone come across that? Okay. Been quite influential. Um, um, it's a computer science vision of how research will be transformed in the future or already is. You know, when you look at you know, theoretical physics, the genome project, uh, other health informatics, transformed completely from um, the three previous paradigms of, of scientific research, empirical, theoretical, and hypothesis driven, I think. I was just gonna look up the third one. Okay, so they're saying there is a fourth paradigm, exploring huge amounts of data, even without a hypothesis, because there are gonna be patterns in there that you weren't even expecting to see. Okay. Quite controversial in some ways, but there's a transition happening, which I see, which is coming from more human sciences and saying, well, okay, yes, our data infrastructure, our computational superpowers are going to help transform, but what does it mean for a whole discipline to evolve and develop a knowledge infrastructure? Um, and, and this is coming from people who study infrastructure and, and knowledge and how that's constructed and shared in in disciplines. And I've been very taken with some of their work. Um, for example, this, this book, A Vast Machine, um, by Paul Edwards, just talks about how the Intergovernmental Climate Change Panel operates and, and the history of trying to track our planet's climate. Okay? And then there was a, a big NSF workshop on knowledge infrastructures, uh, which took the framework of knowledge infrastructure that he developed and just said, this is applicable to many fields. So what is a knowledge infrastructure? It's a robust network of people and artifacts and institutions that generate, share, and maintain specific knowledge about the human and natural world. Okay. Examples being the World Weather Forecast Infrastructure, the Center for De Disease Control, or the IPCC. Okay. And there are many others. Right? This is not just technology at work. This is humans organizing themselves into ways of managing and gathering and validating knowledge with a huge technical infrastructure behind it, of course. Okay. And these aren't systems in the sense that someone designed them, right? These are systems of systems. These are ecologies. And, they, and you figure out how to make them work, both technically and by agreeing ways of working together. Okay. So it's an, it's an organic, evolved thing that is in constant flux. Okay. So when I look at those kinds of definitions, I can see the education system there. Okay? People are, there are lots of different human education systems and there are technical systems we're trying to get talking to each other as well. And one of the key things, of course, is that we see the world through models. Right? Everything we know about the world's climate, past, present and future, we know through models. Today, no collection of signals or observations becomes global in time and space without first passing through a series of data models. So increasingly in my world, we will see what's going on through models. Hence the need to really understand how those models were built, and we'll come to that in a moment. Secondly, I love this statement from Jeff Bowker, there is no such thing as raw data. It's an oxymoron. Right? Rather, you know, data does not just appear raw. Data has been gathered by some people for some purpose at some definition, gathered at a certain periodicity and processed through who knows what before it finally lands on your desktop. Okay. There's a whole book called Raw Data is an Oxymoron. 
Okay, so the question I found myself asking was, are we in transition in education to a new knowledge infrastructure? Because what, what we hear from other fields is that the seams that hold that infrastructure together start coming under stress. Okay. What we see happening are things like changes in the, the social norms and relationships and ways of thinking, acting and working between people in the field. We see changes in authority, influence and power. Okay. So, so with an education, for example, suddenly the publishers like Pearson and McGraw-Hill are heavyweight gorillas. They are holding university data in a way that no private company ever held university data. Right? All our data from Blackboard is held somewhere on servers in the US. Okay? They're influencing all sorts of changes in practice and policy. Universities are suddenly finding they can't get to data they thought they owned. New kinds of knowledge work, okay, this is part of the old automation thing. And increased access for some people may mean other people have reduced access. So again, you might be sitting there thinking, in my field, are we starting to see those changes in the knowledge infrastructure? And I've argued that indeed we are seeing that in education, and there's a talk all about that, if you're interested, you can drill down into. So. In knowledge infrastructure for me is a, is a human-centered way of thinking about what it is we're doing in data-intensive research here at UTS. Finally, just want to unpack the black box a little bit of what actually is in a learning analytics system. And again, by analogy, it might be that we, we would ask, what's inside the black box of an analytics system in your field? Because by understanding what's inside, we start to understand what it means to be transparent and accountable and have integrity. Okay. So in a learning analytics system, there are a number of stakeholders and key moves that are, are, are made. Okay. We have people who know about learning and teaching, and they will come up with theories and frameworks for teaching and all the stuff that those of you who understand anything about teaching will be very familiar with. The interesting thing that happens then is that learning analytics people say, that's really interesting. We're going to try and formalize that in some way. You know, so in this theory, it says, we're really interested when students do this or that. And the learning analytics researcher says, ah, we know that students give off data of this sort. And if we write some software, we could spot that pattern. Okay. They come up with an algorithm, which is essentially you know, a formalism that says, we could, for we, we could computationally spot when we think that's going on. That then becomes real running code when you put programmers on the job. And they are going to generate software. They're going to use hardware. They're going to generate lots of data. And they're going to generate a user interface to actually make what's going on visible in some helpful way, we hope, for a learner or for an educator. Okay. So that's how we get a learning analytics system. But of course, there are some really important transitions being made here. Okay. So we might ask, well, how well did you formalize the key aspects of that theory of good teaching, good learning? How well does the data being generated by that system actually align with that particular philosophy of teaching and learning? Okay. So if, for example, this learning theory says it's terribly important that students engage with each other online in a critical, constructive way. Okay. We're going to expect that data to involve students talking to each other, and we're going to expect the patterns being detected to be to do with the kinds of contributions and ways of contributing and building knowledge that that theory proposed. If this theory is about how students learn to master Pythagoras' theorem and the confusions that arise, of course, the data is going to be completely different. Okay. Are the educational insights aligned with the kinds of things that theory talks about? Are the learning outcomes, of course, this is all about trying to improve learning outcomes, are the students actually gaining insight into the ways that they're contributing online, to take my example? Okay. So, these are ways of looking at the anatomy of your analytic system 
and saying, what's the integrity of this system? Because if somebody wants to unpack the black box, if somebody says, your system gave me wrong advice and I failed my exam, or a parent is worried, what data are you gathering about my child? Or there's concern in you know, an, an education authority about the integrity of the system. Someone needs to be able to unpack that diagram. We can't just say, trust us, you know, we're knowledge engineers. Okay. Okay. And there is a longer version of that talk which unpacks all the different ways in which those relationships can break down or, or hold. So, just to wrap up then, hopefully you understand a little more about what I mean by human-centered now. It's about the way we design something as well as being able to give a good account of what it is we've built. So back to my learning goals. I hope that we've made some progress. Um, I put it to you that this way of approaching data science is one that could play out effectively in many different disciplines in the way that data scientists and AI people are working with health and law and social science and all the other different groups who could be benefiting from data science. And I think we've got time for some dis discussion, so thanks very much. <laughs>